If you want to become a programmer and if you've recently just started out, then this is definitely the video for you. And that's what we're going to talk about here. If you, however, are further down in your trajectory of a programmer, if you're sort of intermediate or like if you're an avid watcher of this channel, then uh, this might this video might be a bit too simple for you. So just a heads up in that no hard feelings, you might want to skip the video. But then again, what I'm going to talk about is sort of a trajectory on or my suggestion on a trajectory of sort of steps to take if you if you want to develop as a programmer. Uh, so even if you're an intermediate programmer, you might find this interesting. But again, like heads up that it might be too simplistic. Anyways, this is a, an answer to a question that was sent to me via scale about and the question was sent by Joseph and you just Joseph, you're essentially saying that uh, you're, you're about to take a gap year and you want to get into programming. And my answer is not, I'm not necessarily limiting myself to sort of what you can do during the period of a single year, because it seems like you were also saying that you might also want to get into programming more long term. So I thought a bit sort of about like how to answer this question. And it's, it's tricky, right? Because uh, it's tricky to say, well, okay, this specific language and then this specific language or like try out this book or try out this course or, or whatnot, right? Because there are so many good options and it's, it's, very, it's very difficult to tell sort of what might work for any given individual because we all sort of uh, like different things and whenever we're sort of intellectually stimulated by something, it's probably easier to learn that thing when, when we feel like, oh, okay, this is cool and I'm kind of getting it and that's interesting. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of like you have to identify those things in order to, uh, to, to sort of uh, be, to be able to struggle through or, or um, have the oh, audacity. No, yeah, it's in order to, to muster the, the, doing all the work is essentially what I'm trying to say. Um, but, but anyway, so, so here's what I think we're going to do. What I think we're going to do is that I, I'm going to uh, suggest sort of a few topics or sort of key things that I think you definitely need to to learn if you're learning programming. And and this is sort of, I mean, it, it's kind of on a high level and it's kind of like I'm just outlining what would be in a, uh, a, a, a university program that would be semi-computer oriented. And, but I think that makes sense if you think about it, right? Because then I, I'm sort of, I want to make these sort of high level points and any of these high level points could be a course in and of itself. Right? So, so then you can go and look for a course like Coursera or YouTube or, or, or a book um, on these specific topics or technologies or languages, right? Um, so let's just dive straight into it, right? And I think, I think you're going to see, see what I'm saying. So programming, how to get started. Ooh, I'm realizing now I can't see my cursor in this presentation mode, so this is going to be interesting. But, but yeah, we'll figure this out. Okay, so what to learn and why, right? what are some of the things that, that you should learn and why should you learn them? Let's jump to the next slide. Of course, let me just mention also that like, this is my opinion. And I, I just uh, like I gave this like, what 30 minutes of, of thinking beforehand. So obviously, it's not a complete picture. And I think probably I'll, I'll do this video again, further down the road during my own development, because I have I, probably I will have realized more things uh, as well. Um, but yeah, and also let me just say, if you're watching this video and you are a programmer, feel absolutely free to share your experiences in the comments because that's how we can we can learn together. There, there are always lots of great comments uh, from you other programmers where, where we can uh, es essentially learn from other, our other experiences, right? So am I missing some things? Am I misrepresenting some things? Anyways, let's dive into it, right? If you want to learn programming, I guess sort of the main question or like the first question is what, what programming language should I learn? And I think of it this way, right? There are more paradigms or there are more ways of slicing the different types of programming languages than the, the way I've sliced it here. But I think this is a fairly useful slicing and I think this is a fairly uh, sense. Uh, so, so I mean, for example, like there are logic programming languages uh, but but like the 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 value add not, not the value add but like the the cost benefit of of learning such a language if you're sort of actually more pragmatically oriented and just want to learn to to productively write code uh, is it, not great right so so I would focus on these sort of two aspects one is so in the top you can see we have this sort of what is called quadrant diagrams we have four places right where it's like we're combining. Uh, either object oriented or functional with either dynamically typed or statically typed. So dynamically typed, so on the top, right, or on the x axis, you can think of it, we have 
the, the type system, right? Like, is it dynamically typed or is it statically typed? But then again, I mean, it's not that simple because you also have weak and strong typing. So maybe this should be like a floating scale between weak typing and strong typing. Uh, but I mean, we're glancing over those details. Essentially, what typing is, is that when you are writing a program, you have uh, either an interpreter or a compiler, which is like a program that reads the program that you've written. And that program can uh, either look at your program and say, you've done something which is uh, invalid on a type level um, before you actually hit the point where that where that thing might crash. And what that what, what that means is uh, sort of more concretely right it's like if you say i have a number but then you try to put some text into that place where you said that you will have a number then that's a type error right it's like you're saying uh, i want to have a i want to have a function that adds numbers but then you pass a, a uh, like a piece of text to that to that function and that just doesn't make any sense right and if you're in, in a, if you're in a dynamically typed language then that's that's fine that like uh, the the compiler uh, is not going to tell you that that's an illegal operation it's not going to to sort of fail the type check because there is no type check ish right i mean i'm oversimplifying in instead it's going to allow you to do that because with that freedom comes a lot of flexibility. So there's a lot of things that you can do with that. So maybe if you send a textual representation of the number two, then maybe you can give yourself the freedom to treat that as the number two, even though it's not actually a number, but it's a textual representation of the number two. But anyways, I mean, this is, we, we don't need to dig into the details here, but that's sort of dynamic typing versus static typing. But then on this Y axis, right, on the, on the vertical axis, you have object oriented versus functional. And these are sort of, in my mind, the two main paradigms, right? Like you have the object oriented languages, then you have the functional languages. And in reality, most languages are a, a like a happy mix of, of a bunch of different concepts, really, like uh, C sharp, for example, has like, lots of functional stu stuff and lots of object oriented stuff and lots of procedural stuff because of like the static keyword and stuff like that. So now I said static, but I don't mean static as in statically typed. Um, but anyways, so, so you have the object oriented languages and you have the functional languages and functional languages are, are well function oriented, more mathematically oriented, and they are concerned with uh, making sure that you write functions that are, sorry, I have to stop my can. Sorry about the break. The cat was wrecking the sofa. Unacceptable. Okay, so um, where was I? Functional languages, right? So, so functional languages are sort of more mathematically oriented in the sense that they are trying to, I mean, and, and don't freak out, freak out about the mathematically oriented. What I mean is essentially just that they're trying to uh, ensure that when you state that some, when you state equality, equality actually means equality. So when you say that like, uh, f of two is equal to five, then that means that five is exactly the same thing as f of two, which isn't necessarily true in an object oriented language, because in object oriented languages, you, you are uh, working with assignment rather than equality. So you're saying, uh, execute the function uh, f of two, compute the value, compute the the result of doing uh, or uh, performing f on two, uh, sorry, f on five, or oh, whatever, it doesn't matter, f on something, right? And then you get a value and then you store that value in a variable, right? So, so it's sort of a more procedural idea. Um, but, but then, I mean, that's, that's just one way of looking at this, but there are tons of difference, differences. I mean, object-oriented languages are essentially, the key point is essentially message passing, right? It's like the idea of passing a message to an object that can choose to respond or not really not, but but like uh, that that can choose uh, to, to whatever it needs to do. So in in functional languages, you have mostly um, algebraic data types, and in object oriented languages, you have abstract data types. Uh, so you have polymorphism 
uh, in in object oriented languages. But anyways, I mean, now I'm dr drifting off, to off, to off topic. The point is that you have these two paradigms of writing programs, and they they achieve the same flexibility or they achieve the same things but in different ways and um, I guess I, I, I would I guess non-controversially argue that uh, functional programming is more expressive so so that it's simpler to express something complex in a functional language it's, it's simpler to express a solution to a complex problem in, in a functional language rather than in, in an object-oriented language which is why object-oriented languages often re uh, uh, receive lots of criticism so but then again i mean object-oriented languages are still extremely used in industry and uh, if nothing else i mean it's extremely interesting to to dive into object-oriented languages because like a person like me would for example argue that most of the time when we're talking about object-oriented code we are not actually talking about object-oriented code we're talking about procedural code written in a language which supports object orientation but when we start to dig into design patterns for example object-oriented design patterns we realize that oh actually we can be very, very, uh, let's say, abstract in an object-oriented language. There are there are some really cool high-level concepts in in even object-oriented languages that allow us great flexibility that we are most of the time not at all using. Right. So so like, it's not all it, like. Uh, I guess what I'm saying is that sometimes we are too quick to blame the paradigm of object orientation when it's more when the the blame should rather be given to ourselves right it's more like we are not uh, abstracting our programs sufficiently but but anyways okay now i'm on a sidetrack as well the reason i'm saying this right is that i think that eventually you should know uh, at least one language in each of these categories like you should know a dynamically typed object-oriented language, a statically typed object-oriented language, a dynamically typed functional language, and a statically typed functional language. Um, I, I mean, I guess I would say because it makes you rounded. That mm, um, I would maybe put it this way. I think the target is static typing, right? But this is this is sort of my personal opinion, right? Um, it's not significantly more expensive to write something in a statically typed language. So like in some sense, maybe we should write all our code in statically typed languages, but sometimes it's just easier and more quick to just do it in a dynamically typed language. And also, I guess the reason I'm actually talking about these, these different dimensions is that I would suggest that someone, when, when, when you start to write code, then you should start in, in what is known as a dynamically typed language. So you should start in something in with something in the left column here. And I would guess that, that many people would suggest that you start with an object oriented language, right? I'm not sure. Like I would say, for example, if you if you look at so I mean the languages in these or the texts in the in these uh, four quadrants are example languages, right? So there are of course tons of more languages, and there is of course a lot of debate to be had whether the languages that I've put here actually fit the description or not, right? And you can see, for example, JavaScript is in both uh, dynamically typed object oriented and dynamically typed functional because you have classes in in uh, JavaScript, but you also have like, but but for functions are also first class citizens in, in, in JavaScript. So I mean, the definitions are a bit uh, or I'm, I'm using the definitions a bit loosely. And if somebody is really um, like a purist, they would probably say that this conceptualization that I've done here is potentially wrong, but who cares, right? Um, so so I would say if you start with a dynamically typed functional language, I would say starting with JavaScript and approaching it as a functional language is totally fair, right? I, I would say that that's probably pretty doable. I don't know if I would start with Clojure, for example, right? I, so, I mean, let me just say, I don't I don't know Clojure, uh, but so I, I know some Haskell, for example, and then I'm just thinking about Haskell, but removing the type safety. And then I'm like, oh, maybe, maybe not, right? I don't know. Maybe somebody who, who knows uh, Clojure better can, can give an opinion as to whether, in, in the comment section, as to whether you think that's a suitable first language. But otherwise, I mean, writing code in a sort of very procedural style, in a sort of do this, then do that, then do this, then do, like, like, uh, 
add one to, add one to two and put that value in the variable x right and then uh, add five to the value x and put that result in the value in the variable y like this kind of stuff that's more of a procedural paradigm but you could do that in an object oriented language simpler than you could do in a in a uh, functional language but again like javascript sort of falls under both of these categories at the same time but anyway so so I guess if you're starting out with a new language I would choose any of those right like Ruby Python or JavaScript no problems right great first languages and then you don't have to worry about the whole type system right you can just focus on figuring out how to put things into variables and execute functions or uh, construct classes and and make instances of these classes right and you don't have to think too much about types and I think that maybe that's a good thing right it's yeah so I mean I started in action script action script 2.0 so flash right and and then action script was dynamically typed then eventually you had like optional static typing but I mean I, I learned it sort of dynamically typed and I think that was a that just makes you it, it gives you the ability to move to, to produce code without having to think too much about what what the code that you're doing actually actually uh, means in terms of the in terms of the types which i mean maybe you somebody would argue that that's a bad thing but but i would say depending on how you, pragmatic you are as a person that's a good thing because that means you can actually get out there and produce code and, and sort of go on with your life right uh, but eventually you, you should move into static typing right because that learns you a lot about types it learns you a lot about let's say, uh, inheritance, or at least um, in, uh, implementing interfaces, right? And, and uh, so, so uh, coupling to abstractions rather than to concretions. Thinking about these sort of more high level concepts, I think is much, much easier to do in a statically typed language, because then we always have to define the contracts. I mean, I, I'm understanding that some of the words I'm saying, depending on how new you are as a program, it might not make sense, but it doesn't matter. I'm just uh, I, I'm emphasizing that that there are good reasons as to why it's important to learn static typing, right? So I would say that then that static typing it makes it easier for you to understand uh, how to couple to abstractions rather than to concretions because you always have to specify the con contracts and then it becomes evident when you are coupling to a contract which is a concretion as opposed to when you're coupling to a contract which is an abstraction, right? So so this is sort of when we, we start to move into ideas such as design patterns and we start to think about things like, well, do I really care about being being passed? Do, like, does my function care about whether it's being passed a... Uh, I'm sorry for all these animal examples all the time, right? But but does it does it really care about whether I'm past a cat or do I really care about being past an animal? But actually, do I really care care about whether it passes me an animal? Isn't maybe what I'm uh, concerned about is that it passes me something that is has the capacity to speak, let's say, or like has the capacity to to move. Like if you're implementing a game, right? Like I don't care about whether like you pass me a player or not i care about whether you pass me something which has the capacity to move and has the capacity to attack let's say right i mean hypothetically right but uh, but so yeah so eventually you have to move into static typing and then uh, i guess if you're in the object oriented land i guess c sharp java great great uh, languages to start out with and then more tricky languages, I guess, would be, for example, uh, Haskell. So if we look at statically typed functional languages, you have languages such as Haskell, OCaml, and, and F Sharp, for example. And, uh, and again, maybe I would like, I, I mean, I think I would probably, I would probably go, I mean, at least, okay, so what I did is I went dynamically typed object oriented to statically typed object oriented to dynamically typed functional to statically typed functional and that progression sort of made sense to me but i don't know i think probably any progression is fine as long as you're thinking about which place here your your uh like in which quadrant the language that you're learning is in and and that's sort of the point of of learning the next language right so you learn something which is not in the same quadrant that's important right so you pick something in one quadrant and then you learn something which is in a different quadrant and then you reflect upon the differences between these two languages and then you keep going until you have all the quadrants and you can definitely use javascript for both dynamically typed object oriented and dynamically typed functional if you choose a learning resource that is 
that is designed to learn you the object-oriented part or the functional part, right? So there are books on, for example, functional programming in JavaScript, and there are books, I guess, I, I don't actually know, but I would guess, on object-oriented JavaScript. So so I would say if, if you're going to choose that, you need to make sure that like the learning resources is, is, uh, is specifying which paradigm it sort of aims you to learn or aims to learn you. Anyway, so, so that's what I wanted to say here, right? It doesn't matter too much uh, which language uh, you choose, in my mind, and all of the languages that are on the screen, I think, are great candidates as for a for a first language to learn. I don't know why I said closure was was not. I mean, never mind me, right? I mean, I think all of these are great languages to to learn as as a first language for sure, right? If you want to if you want to have something which is just really intuitive and fast and and probably like you can you can do things that seem useful very quickly then i would go with ruby or python right these to me these seem well boxed enough so you don't have to worry about lots of ecosystem problems and you don't have to worry about things such as purity and you don't have to worry about types and you don't even have to worry about object orientation because you can start using them as as a sort of procedural languages and then quickly move over to object orientation when you feel um, sufficiently ready. So I think Ruby and Python are probably two great options as of as a first language, right? But then you move on to other languages. Okay, but let's let's skip let's move on from this slide. Okay. So beyond that, right? What are some topics that you definitely need to learn? Okay, so if you, you have a language, right? And I mean it's difficult to say whether you're learning these things in that language or whether you are uh, learning a language by, for example, reading a book or taking a course and then when you're done that, you move into the next thing, right? Probably that's, that's sort of one way of approaching it. So it's like, let's say you pick Ruby, right? So you're learning basic Ruby by reading a book and doing lots of Ruby. And then when you're done doing that, uh, then you sort of maybe move to advanced Ruby by looking at one of these, uh, one of these topics. But, but maybe some of these topics are, let's say, okay, so, so the first topic I mean is algorithms and data structures. Actually, that one and object-oriented design patterns, yeah, yeah, let me, let me correct myself. Object-oriented design patterns, for that, I think to get the most of that, you need a statically typed object-oriented language. So C Sharp or Java, for example, and then try to stick to the really object-oriented parts. For algorithms and data structures, I would say, I mean, you could probably, I, you should probably use a, a object-oriented language in, in my mind to, or not necessarily, okay, yeah, never mind. I mean, I guess just avoid maybe things such as pattern matching in order to get the really, uh, in order to, to get to the core of the original al algorithms that, that um, are usually passed around, like the sorting algorithms, for example. That, that's like the, okay, let me, let me restart. When learning algorithms and data structures, you are, wait, wait, cat paws. Okay, sorry. So, so when learning algorithms and data structure structures, what you're essentially doing is that you're learning how to build your own types, which are these de data structures, and you are learning how to, uh, or maybe I should say, uh, common types, commonly used types, right? Such as linked lists or binary trees, and then you're learning algorithms, which are ways of transforming these types. Uh, so, for example, like inserting a node into a binary tree or like uh, searching through a, a, a linked list. So like sorting algorithms or stuff like that. That's that's part of, of uh, learning algorithms and data structures. And I guess like it would make sense to choose... Uh, no, but yeah, I mean, actually, yeah, any, any of the languages are fine. I, I've... Uh, so, so, so I'm... Yeah side side note but i'm currently doing a um, a phd and my um, phd supervisor we had a discussion the other day where he was saying that uh, some of the functional languages such as for example ocaml and uh, and haskell if you use pattern matching the the algorithms that you design look very different from the sort of original algorithms that that are commonly taught and i think i mean that's an interesting that's interesting because still 
uh, the, the pattern matched Haskell way of defining the algorithm might still actually be preferable because it's, it's uh, easier to reason about for, the, for us as developers. But when learning algorithms and data structures, you should probably go the hard way and, and do it sort of the, the, the classic way in order to see more of the underlying uh, logic, like you, like you take the value from here and you put the value into here and then you take the value from here and, like, and so forth. So, so yeah, I mean, if you want to be on the, yeah, I don't know. Okay, let me, let me, let me restart again. But maybe, maybe this is a good way of thinking about it. I would guess that there are a lot of, ah, never mind, right? right? Ooh, okay, wait, 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 another cat pulls. So this is probably the way I should say it. What I should say is find a book, okay? Use a book or a course as a resource for both, actually for all of, no, 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 for the first three things on this list, for algorithms and data structures, for object-oriented design patterns, and for databases. Use a, find a course, like, I mean, when I say course, I mean like anything that's, uh, that's, that has like a, uh, somebody's thought about the curriculum and tries to teach you things in a sort of consecutive manner, whether that's on like Coursera or I don't know, like any of these is like uh, free courses online or like a series of blog posts, but it has to be like a fairly long series of blog posts uh, or, or again, like an actual book or like a video series on, on YouTube or preferably multiple ones of these. Um, so if somebody has designed a curriculum, they've probably thought a bit about like the, the, the language and, and how these algorithms are implemented in, in the language and the algorithms and data structures are implemented in the language. So anyway, just follow whatever language you chose in the first step, I guess. Or if you've moved to a second language, then, then focus on that second language. But maybe just try to, try to nail uh, uh, these more advanced topics in the, in the thing that you started with before. Of course, if we move to the second point, object-oriented design patterns, that's of course for uh, object-oriented languages. So for dynamically typed languages or for statically typed languages. But I would say here, definitely express the design patterns when you're learning in a statically typed object-oriented language to make sure to make sure that you really understand the 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 pattern, right? Because it's Again, since you're not explicitly expressing uh, superclasses or interfaces, or I mean superclasses you are, but, but interfaces in, in a dynamically typed language because you're using this thing called duct typing, then it's, it's pretty easy to kind of miss the point or, or miss the quotation marks magic of, of the pattern or like how, how the thing actually works. So I would say it's great fun to do them in dynamic languages, but also make sure to do them in a statically typed language. Um, yeah, so I know I'm, yeah, yeah, so I, I think that makes sense, okay. And then the third point is databases, right? So you need to learn about databases. And I would say this about databases. It took me a long while to sort of realize that when we're talking about databases and when we're talking about multiple different types of databases, actually I have another slide. Yeah, so here's an, let's jump to that as well, right? So there are different types of databases, relational databases, document databases, key value databases, and for example, graph databases, right? I think there are some more categories, but, but these to me seem sort of as the main or like the main ones. The thing is, I would say, make sure you learn algorithms and data structures before you dive into databases. And there's a very important reason for that. And, and the reason is that databases are actually just programs that are helping you to maintain a data structure, right? There's, there's actually like no more magic to it. I mean, there's some, there's some craft, right? But like, essentially that's the thing. And that's really important to understand. And, and, and actually it took me a really long time to understand that. And I'm very confused about why nobody actually told me that. Because then when people start to yammer on about like, well, have you used this cool NoSQL document database, right? You have the capacity to say, wait, wait, wait. Okay, well, so, so you, you, you mean uh, a, a, a dynamically typed, or I mean, uh, like uh, you, you mean a, a, a dictionary in a dynamically typed language, essentially, right? Like that's what you're talking about, to store your data in that, for example, right? I mean, I'm not saying all document databases behave like that. Of course not, right? But, but um, what, what I mean is that understanding databases as data types helps you to make an educated decision as to whether a particular database is suitable for your scenario or not, right? Because it's actually all about, let's, let's think about this. There's a few, few things such as um, uh, anomalies, 
let's say ac acidity, like following the acid rules, and um, uh, insertion and and extraction times, or like read write times, and those are sort of like the key points. And 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 different databases have different advantages. Right, so so maintaining or avoiding anomalies. I'm just using the, these words right, right now, but but uh, so maybe I should have put those on the slide as well, right? But but uh, those are things that you will come in contact with if you are learning databases. And and I, so what I would say is absolutely, positively, definitely learn relational databases. Yes, you can read up on these other ones, but absolutely, positively, definitely learn relational databases because that will give you an introduction to. Uh, the acid rules to uh, anomalies, which are actually extremely important, uh, and it will give you an introduction to indexes, so it will spawn a discussion on, on read-write times, and hopefully if you have a good resources, if you have a, find a good resource, it will also teach you about denormalization, right? So when, when I said anomalies, what you do to avoid anomalies which are bad is that you normalize your, your uh, data model. But then, if you want to have, if, if you have a scenario where you need speed, then you might denormalize your your data model in order to gain speed. And so, and if you think about it, then like denormalization then really starts to look like these other things. Not necessarily, uh, maybe not graph. Yeah, I mean, never mind. Never mind. Essentially, so the point is that. Uh, Thinking of these, thinking of any given database as a data structure helps you understand that uh, that particular database, and it's really important to get in touch or to get exposed to these classic ideas in database databases, such as again the ones I said, like uh, the normalization or anomalies, uh, denormalization, read write speeds, and and acid, uh, and I mean I said read write speed, read write speed. That's just like. Uh, uh, informally, right? Don't like that's the other ones you can Google for, but I, I'm not sure if you can Google for like read write speeds. The, the, the point is just uh, different, like lookup speeds, right? Like different data structures have different, uh, sorry, wait, what's the term? Uh, comp uh, not computational complexity, but uh, time complexity, right? That, so that's. Yeah, I would say maybe that's not extremely. That's I was thinking maybe time complexity should have been here on the important topics, but actually, uh, actually no. Time complexity you will be introduced to when you uh, read algorithms and data structures. You will be introduced to time complexity and space complexity, right? And and those concepts will be very useful when you then dive into the, uh, different types of databases. But again, if you're going to learn one thing, learn relational databases. And if you're going to learn more things, definitely still learn relational databases. OK, so we've covered here. Uh, I'm back on this slide. We've covered algorithms and data structures. We've covered object-oriented design patterns. We've talked about databases. Then. This is a bit of a contentious issue, right? Then you need to learn something about the systems development life cycle. And I've put agile development here in parentheses because when I opened the Wikipedia page for systems development life cycle, it was mainly mostly about the waterfall method. That's not what I mean that you should learn, of course. What I'm struggling to find a better term here. And if somebody has a better term, please do shoot something in the comments and suggest that, right? So, so what I mean is that I, I would suggest that you get exposed to the idea of agile development. But agile development is sort of one uh, concept or one implementation in a, a uh, of a more general phenomena, which is this idea of that we need to project plan the, the building of our systems when we're working with multiple people, right? So I, I'm just emphasizing this because I think it's important to get exposed to the idea that you're not working alone if you're a programmer who is not working alone. Right? But like, if you want to become a programmer who works at a company, then you will work with other people. And that's a very important aspect. And then you might have clients whom you are developing software for, and then it's very important that you know how to make yourself understood and to understand your clients, right? Um, so something like that, maybe read something, find a course on Agile or something like that, right? Find find a, yeah, but probably, I mean, this is why I put Agile in parentheses, maybe find a course or a book on, on Agile development or Agile methodologies. Um, but But kind of be careful here, right? Because this is kind of like the database stuff. There are so much marketing bollocks, right? There are so many people who, who are just sort of, 
uh, what is that term like taunting the yeah i don't know like the, 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 like keep hitting the bell over and over it's like oh this is a great course on, on like a super speed course on agile right don't 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 pay anyone to understand agile let me just say it that way right <laughs> it's it's simpler than that um but okay so you need some, something like that i was thinking actually maybe i should have said that maybe a book like something like on object-oriented modeling or something like that might help. Yeah, so maybe there should actually be something like conceptual modeling here. Uh, that, that would be an important topic because that helps you sort of model scenarios before you're actually building them. But I'm super hesitant to suggest UML, for example, but uh, okay, let's drop that, let's drop that. Let's, let's stick to this list, okay. Then the last point is, is pretty silly in comparison to these other big topics. I put bash here, right, which is like, a, a Unix terminal. So um, I think this is a very personal opinion, but I think learning Bash or learning to use Bash to to uh, I mean do simple things, just super simple things like navigate between different folders on my computer, uh, like read the output of a file, maybe like pipe the output of a file into some program and then write that output into another file. That has made me a way better programmer. And that has also helped me understand the power of functional programming because the existence of pipes in bash. So this is why I'm saying bash and not a command prompt, right? So you need something which has the pipe operator. But this is really, I mean, I guess you, I should have put this in parentheses sort of. The other stuff is like a, a bazillion times more important uh, in regards to, to, to learning programming. But but uh, learning how to use Bash is is also like let me put it this way it's also very useful because like <laughs> I hesitate to say this but like all important um, uh, open source software ships without a user interface right unless it's like it's been around for a very long time and usually like it ships without an installer right so you have to learn. Ooh, this I should have put, sorry, I should have put version control. So please make a mental note here of version control, right? And maybe actually, yeah, I don't know. I was going to say maybe you would inadvertently learn bash while learning version control, but let's keep these as two points. Mentally add a note here, which is, which is version control. And I would suggest just learn git, G-I-T, right? There are other things such as subversion, for example, but like the industry industry standard is essentially Git. So so like just learn Git. And there are tons of courses on Git. There are tons of books on Git. And there are lots of tutorials. I, I think there are great probably video series on, on, on learning Git. But that's very important, right? But again, not as important as learning algorithm data structures, object-oriented design patterns, and databases. Like these things just come first. No doubt, right? And then you can deal with this other stuff such as bash and and uh, um, and git, so version control. And of course, uh, like if we talk about agile development, for example, there's no point in learning agile development if you don't yet know how to write code, right? Like learn how to write code and then learn about agile development. Or at least, I mean, at least learn how to write code to some to some point. Okay, but uh, I digress. I think this makes sense, right? So, so bash the bash point is essentially you need to be uh capable of working in a terminal and again like these things will take time again like uh, the, this point about learning stuff within one year i would just say get started and get going and see how far you can get and then like don't, don't, don't worry about uh, um, about like what you can fit in one year just go and and then see how far you can can come this is sort of a long trajectory that will take probably multiple years right which is a good thing because there's always more to learn okay Let's jump to the next next slide. I think this is the next to the last slide and then I'll try to be quiet. So um, I put a question mark here because I don't actually know whether you want to get into web development. I just, sorry, just because I like web development, I assume that a lot of people want to get into web development. But notice how I put web development here and I didn't put web development earlier, right? So I think it actually makes sense to start with web, web development later. Like make sure you have these things such as like, learn about data structures, learn about algorithms, learn about design patterns, duh, 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 and then learn about web development. Or maybe learn it as you go along, but the other things are more fundamental, right? Web development is this sort of 
like like um, it's lots of like the, these uh, technologies that we're stuck with for historic reasons that are like that that have very uh, unboxed or poorly boxed ecosystems where it's like well does this browser support this thing or does this browser support this thing and like some people like CSS and some people don't like CSS and everybody writes their JavaScript in different ways and like should you bundle your JavaScript and it's like okay well you need build systems and like there's just all this stuff that is that is completely irrelevant in, in regards to learning programming like completely irrelevant right but they are relevant in terms of shipping web software, like shipping software on the web. For sure, they are relevant, right? But they will just take away from the experience of learning how to write code, right? Just learn how to become a programmer first and then learn these messy technologies, right? That, that's what I would say at least. Or again, like think of this as your, your nighttime or like evening job, right? Where it's like, you're you're if you're if you choose python for example like you're learning python by day and then maybe you're doing a bit of html and css and maybe some javascript by night right but like the main thing you have to learn is 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 python and then like move into algorithms and all of that stuff okay but that's the way i would see that right and of course there are great books on on web development so you can like if you've learned to write code already and then get a book on on uh, on web development that maybe even talks about all of these three technologies at the same time. Zwoosh! I mean, I think you're gonna have a breeze, right? It's it's probably not gonna be a big issue, right? Going the other way, not so much, right? It's like learning HTML, JS, uh, or HTML, JavaScript, and, and CSS, and then moving into something like Python, right? It's, I would say maybe a bit trickier because then you've learned JavaScript in the context of web development, which is a much more specific. Uh, context than if you learn JavaScript as a programming language, right? As in like, I, I kind of mean as in Node, right? Uh, uh, Node, Node.js, as in kind of learning to use JavaScript in order to solve algorithmic problems, right? It's it's general purpose programming language. But if you learn it in the context of web development, then, then you will probably be, be, be very specifically focused on sort of visual manipulations of uh, of web pages, which is useful again, right? But but which is not, it's not about learning to, to, to become a programmer, right? It's becoming a programming is, becoming a programmer is more about learning these general things, like general purpose programming. Okay, that, so that's that about web development. But but eventually, I mean, if you, if you want to get into web development, definitely do it and there are tons of great books. Okay, actually, sorry, I have two last slides and I'll go quick. So these are just, these things change all the time, all the time. This is just, I picked a few things uh, where I just want to say, if you want to get into to some web stuff and you feel like you've already done lots of these other things, again, like, let me just emphasize again, these important topics list, this is much, much, much more important, right? But when you feel like you're getting a grip of different things, I, I just want to give you something that you, so like, you have a trajectory where it's like, well, what's the next thing, right? Like, can I j dive, dive into something more? Then these are some interesting web technologies that I would look at if I felt like, well, I'm sort of getting design patterns, I'm sort of getting algorithms, and I, I'm doing a bit of a, a, a JavaScript, and like, I, I, can, I can manage to build web pages, like, where should I go, right? Some of these things, right? React, more specifically Redux, right? Firebase is something super cool where, where, it's, uh, where you don't have to worry about the back end, for example. Um, Vue.js, cool new library. Uh, and then we have these things like Elm, PureScript, Ramda, and Sanctuary that sort of help you bring uh, statically typed functional programming into JavaScript. So these are all sort of JavaScript, oh, sorry, all of them are JavaScript languages, uh, JavaScript libraries except Firebase, which is a Google technology, I guess, right? It's like, I guess you could call it part of the sort of buzzword serverless, right? So if you want to buzzword to look for or to, to buzzword to Google, you could Google serverless. Um, but actually, yeah, I put I should have put fantasy land specification, reason ML and TypeScript also in the same bucket, right? Because they are also sort of focused on making statically typed or JavaScript uh, statically typed and functional. So you can see actually that I'm super biased as an individual, right? Because I'm, when I say interesting web technologies, or like I say interesting web technologies, and then I'm just pointing you towards things that are trying to make JavaScript statically typed and functional. But you know, that's, it is what it is. That, that's, 
that's where I would say that we that we have to go. So if I chose if I would choose a trajectory, assuming that I, I'm getting all of these or like sort of understanding the other things that we talked about, then I would definitely jump into these things. But okay, that's just some hand picked stuff that I, I just like, <laughs> I spent two minutes picking them, right. And then also like, th this is this is something like, you're gonna find your favorite people on, for example, YouTube, and you'll notice that there are a lot of people who are giving, like, you find one good talk by a person, and then you realize that's probably because they're pretty charismatic. And then you keep googling for that person. And then you'll see that they have more interesting talks. And I think that's a that's been so great, man. I've spent so many hours watching uh, watching interesting talks on, on YouTube on programming, uh, sort of high and low, and like uh, very specifically in terms of coding and, and on a, very on a high level, like sort of discussion topics. And, and like, I hesitated to mention a few people because uh, again, like I spent two minutes thinking about that and then uh, I'm gonna miss like bazillions of people who have who have inspired me but these are just some people that came to mind that that i i find uh, have made points where i go like oh right or like you just there's this click moment where you're like i never thought about it that way but that just fundamentally makes perfect sense right so I don't know, maybe that's because these these people are sometimes expressing their opinions as if they were controversial but but i don't know like check check these people out right again this is me trying to give you stuff to do uh, beyond the obvious path of learning for example design patterns and algorithms uh so so this is again like the nighttime stuff right i wouldn't spend my daytime doing these things until I, I feel like there is, well, I mean, that's a stupid thing to say. I was going to say until I feel like there's nothing more to do, right? But, but I mean, there's always something more to do. This is, I should really say, this is nighttime activity, right? Or evening time activity, because there's always something more to do. Like, I guess, in some sense, I guess there's always category theory, right? So, so we could even push towards category theory, and then that's going to take a long time. I mean, I don't know, category theory. So, um, but yeah, anyways. Check these people out. Put their names in in on YouTube, and you you'll find some some interesting talks. Maybe I should say a few things, right? So like Sandy Metz has some interesting talks on on uh, object oriented Ruby and like how how we can really think in an object oriented sense. Uh, Rich Hickey is the person who uh, wrote Closure, the language Closure, I think, right? And he's a very uh, so so that's a dynamically typed functional language. So he's, he has lots of interesting ideas there. Where on for, or talks on, for example, transducers. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna realize I, I can't remember why I've put Brian or I can't remember Brian Cantrill now. I mean, I, I remember the person, but I can't remember anything specific. He talks a lot about stories. Eh, anyways, okay, just, just it's a charismatic dude. Th this I know, right? Uh, Mishko Hevery uh, talks a lot about like uh, the solid design principles. Does he talk about the solid design principles? At least he talks about um, how to how to avoid. Uh, yeah, he does talk about the solid design principles. I think a bit, right? Like single responsibility, at least. So, so I've mainly watched him because of dependency injection and because of l sort of learning why singleton pattern is bad and why the static keyword is bad and why that doesn't actually belong in an object-oriented context. Gary Bernard has, I mean, one of my favorite talks by him was Boundaries, which sort of um, points to, let's say, the, the difference between, or let's say a pragmatic approach towards uh, using functional programming. So he suggests sort of having a a uh, functional core and an imperative shell, which will kind of make sense if you watch that talk. But like, let me just emphasize also like that talk is one of these talks that I found like years back, right? And then I've rewatched it uh, like, like a year later, right? And then like a year later, and like initially I understand, I understood nothing, right? I was like, I can see how this guy is making a point which I sh like I should understand because it just like intuitively it seems important but I just couldn't understand it but then eventually like I just like I get it and and in some sense then it's like oh okay but this is trivial <laughs> right but it's also very very true right um 
and yeah, Ke Kevin Henney, very, very controversial dude, uh, interesting talks, uh, lots on, uh, let's say design, right? Or like how to design a system so that other people can actually read it. Uh, Robert C. Martin, also known as Uncle Bob, also known as Bob Martin. Um, he is given lots of talks on the solid principles. Uh, again, like pretty controversial, um, maybe tone down everything that he says a bit, <laughs> but, but otherwise. Ben Ornstein, uh, not a very controversial dude, but like a uh, very charismatic speaker, right? And, and uh, I watched one of his talks way back, which is called Refactoring from Good to Great, which made me realize, again, like this idea of um, really thinking about how to design programs, not only in terms of, well, we've solved the problem now, so fine, let's ship the code and let's sort of go to bed, right? More like, let's think long term in, in about our programs. So like, well, you have something that looks good, but can you make it actually great, right? So that you won't have problems tomorrow with this code base. Um, and yeah, Drew, but he has some, some new talks on, on functional programming. I mean, everybody's moving into functional programming. I shouldn't say that. I don't know if that's true, but I, I, it seems to me that, <laughs> that that's the case. Okay, I think actually that's, that's what I had. Yep, that's the end of the slideshow. Let me jump back in here. So um, that, that, those are sort of my thoughts on, on how to get started with, uh, with programming, what to learn, and, and uh, I, hopefully I, I've sort of explained why, why I think you should learn that. What do you guys think, right? Let me know in the comments if you think what I'm saying makes sense or if you would suggest a different trajectory or like removing some things or adding different things. And, and again, like if you're learning programming and you feel totally overwhelmed by what just happened, don't worry about it. Like, like seriously, get started on one thing and just keep doing that and focus on becoming better on that thing, right? Like focus on, 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 on improving uh, within that thing that you're trying to learn, right? Like, like whenever you find something which doesn't work, then you would say, well, why doesn't that work, right? And then you understand why, like you figure out why, and then you find a new problem, and then you understand why, and then you find a new problem, and just so forth, right? Like, relent be relentless and don't give up, right? And and uh, this is a long journey. Right? I, I, what I've outlined is an extremely long journey that will might take a long time, or, I mean, depending on um, if you ch happen to choose a particularly great path, it might not take you a long time but but I, I would suggest that this is a it's a definitely a valuable path path to walk i was going to say something but I, but i forgot it um but yeah like focus on key on moving forward ah and also i wanted to say that don't feel discouraged in terms of that like let's say for example this quadrant diagram like it's like oh well but i have to learn four languages before i can call myself a programmer don't worry about that i would say just make sure that you are or like start to learn one language and then become like sort of proficient where it's like well you can do some stuff in that language and then start calling yourself a programmer dude like it's welcome to the community of programmers <laughs> right you're you're totally a legitimate programmer if, if you know how to solve a few things in that language for sure and i think that's an important part of uh becoming better because then you identify as a programmer and then you, you you start to feel that it's hopefully that it's your responsibility to figure out why things aren't working the way you you expect them to, to work and then like become better and, and learn to solve more complex problems. Okay, now I really need to be quiet. So hopefully I think this sort of makes sense. Again, let me know what you think in the comments. Remember to subscribe if you're not already subscribed to the channel. We have tons of stuff here. And if you want to ask the next question, check out the link in the description where uh, for where you can ask a question on scale about. Hit like if you appreciate the video and otherwise thanks a ton for watching and I will see you in the next video.